This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Korberlein. Science cannot happen in a vacuum. A political vacuum, that is. In order to drum up public support for research, many scientists find that they need to put on a suit and head to Washington, D.C. Dr. Scott Franklin, professor of physics at the Rochester Institute of Technology, is one such researcher. On today's show, he'll explain the continual need to reach out to the lawmakers that fund today's scientific projects. I understand that you've done some, I think it's called congressional advocacy. You've gone down to Washington and met with senators and congressmen. And they're aides. They're aides. They're aides. I've, they're I've aides. Never, so never met I've never actually <laughs> met with the senators and congressmen in a, in a formal meeting. And this is, this is on an aspect of lobbying for science? Is that? Well, I like to say that I'm not a lobbyist, that we okay. never lobby. I certainly don't have enough money to be a lobbyist, and, and I'm not <laughs> articulate enough or glib enough to be, to be a lobbyist. So, so we advocate for science and science education, policy, and funding. I guess in some sense it seems almost kind of against the spirit of science (laughs) because one of the common complaints that people have about scientists is that we're politically involved. You know, we're doing this for a political agenda. Global warming is because of, you know, we have ideas of what society should be doing. So science is in many ways a very bipartisan issue, and Republicans and Democrats are unified in the notion that science and technology have been critical, instrumental in are maintaining a technological edge in in an educated workforce, maintaining America's leadership in the world, and all of the things that we enjoy, TVs, cars, iPads, iPhones, really result from the investment in science and technology that was made 30, 40, 50 years ago. So when we talk about congressional advocacy, we're not talking about these hot button issues that are thorny and and for which there is a very great diversity of opinion. What we're trying to, to advocate for is the notion that science and technology is instrumental to the American way of life, that we reap the benefits of it every day, that our leadership position in the world resulted from the investments that were made in the past, uh, whether it was directed towards NASA, the the launch to the moon that led to many uh, advances, the internet, which came out of a government lab, graphical user interfaces, had significant federal funding before Mm -hmm. it became a a billion-dollar industry. The investment in science in a very broad sense is what we're advocating for, not any of the politically charged issues, which which are thorny. The idea of science and science research in general. That's right. And there are aspects of that that are currently being debated that we scientists, I think, have a very vested role in. For example, uh, there was a proposal last year that would have limited any scientist to one NSF award over their entire career. Right? Oh, okay. Now, to a non-scientist, that sounds like a very reasonable proposal. Each scientist gets a little bit of taxpayer-funded dollars spread that the gets them their seed funded. and Right, exactly, spread the wealth. To those of us who are in the scientific community, however, we realize that, in fact, uh, it is the sustained funding that allows you to really dig deep and that in the absence of federal funding, laboratories uh, dry up and faculty and scientists go elsewhere to find jobs, sometimes overseas. Mm-hmm. And so those are the types of issues that scientists have insight into that the congressional aid or the layperson may not. Are you trying to lay out plans in terms of specific policy issues, or are you, I guess, presenting one side based on the debate that's been happening? So it depends very much on the time. And and so I've been doing this now for about five years, and I, I should say it is a blast. It is a lot of fun. There are a few things that I have enjoyed more than visits to, to Capitol Hill. It, it completely makes it worth wearing a suit and tie. You're one of the few. I, I, <laughs> I will gladly put on a suit and tie to go into Capitol Hill. And and I'm starry-eyed in this way, right? I, I still feel that it is remarkable that anyone can walk into our governmental buildings. You pass through a metal detector that is less intrusive than the one you get at the airport, and you're mm-hmm. there. And you are walking past congressional offices. You are seeing rooms where very profound decisions are made. We are still one of the few governments that allows that, and we were the first. You know, I hate to be all starry-eyed and 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 you USA know, number I, one, right? But but I happen to think that that is a very very unique, interesting part of our government, and it still excites me. I'm not naive. I realize that that over the last five years, the chance that I've had sort of a, an impact that has tipped the balance on legislation is very small. That's not the goal. So sometimes we have a specific ask where we go in and we start by saying, "We know you are considering." 
a continuing resolution. Right. And we think that as you do this continuing resolution just sets the funding to be whatever it was the previous year. We think that that would hurt science because this is what it would do to NSF. So instead of a continuing resolution, please pass a budget and think about increasing the money that you give to basic research um, fundamental science at the National Science Foundation, at the Department of Energy, uh, and then we could have a specific request like that. Mm-hmm. In science education, for example, sometimes we will go in and we will say one of our uh, items on our agenda is we feel that every American high school student deserves a physics class taught by a qualified physics teacher. And right. here's what we mean by that. 70% of high school students are being taught by a high school teacher who has never taken a physics class. Right. And we think right. that that is hurting our society. And so we we are advocating for policies, we are asking for monies to be written into appropriation bills that will allow high schools to identify and hire physics teachers who actually have degrees in physics, whether right. it's a minor, an undergraduate degree, or even a master's in physics. Right, so that they've they had have college that. level physics. And, and that's something that is particular to the physics and hard sciences. Biology, for example, is most often taught by someone with a biology, some biology training. Mm-hmm. Math and physics are the two that are the lowest. I mean, when you go down to Washington, <clears throat> do you have specific plans of on this day you're meeting this person? Yes. Do you wander the halls looking no, no, for aides. <laughs> the, the nice thing is that they, and I mean the, the staff aides in the Capitol Hill offices, this is what they do. So the very first time I did this, I simply called up my representatives. At the time, it was uh, Congressman Tom Reed and Senators Schumer and Gillibrand at the time. And I said, I'm going to be in Washington this day. Do you have time where I could meet with somebody and talk about science and science education policy? Right. And this is the type of request they get 100 times a day. So they said, absolutely. Can you come in at this time? to meet with this person, and it may be as short as 10 minutes. These are not long meetings. It's been a tremendous lesson in framing my request. It's the elevator speech. It's the elevator speech, exactly. And it inverts the way of discussion, right? As a scientist, we're used to laying out a chain of evidence Mm -hmm. and getting to the point at the end. It's and a tentative we, point at that. That's right. And a very <laughs> tentative point at that. We qualify everything. And on Capitol Hill, that is completely upside down because they are used to people asking for things. They want you to ask for things. Right. right? That's how they know what their constituents are, are concerned about. Once you make that ask, they then start thinking about what information they will need to help get what you want. So the goal is to shut up so that they can ask you the questions that they need, that we shouldn't presume that we know what argument will best work for them. So so it completely inverts the discussion. You walk in and you say, hi, I'm Scott Franklin. I'm a professor of physics at Rochester Institute of Technology, and I'm here to talk with you about funding for science education policy. And we are concerned about getting more high quality physics teachers into the nation's high schools. Done. And then they and ask then the you questions. Stop, and you give them a fact sheet and you wait for them to ask a question and they'll say, oh, well, I see that only 30% are being taught by physicists. Who's teaching the others? And then right. you can go and into you your go spiel into about question. everyone else. Or they may say, what's the, the roadblock? Why are people not? Right. And then you go into that spiel. Why does it matter? Why can't anybody teach Why physics? Why does it matter? Exactly. That's actually a very important point because uh, society seems to have a, a a very large split between science and technology. Mm-hmm. And and so the American Physical Society commissioned a poll a few years ago, and one of the things that was surprising was how many people were in favor of technology and how few people were in favor of, of fundamental science. And something like 80 or 90 percent of the population when asked to to describe where does science take place, couldn't describe anything. Had no idea of of who does science. Right. Well, two thirds of Americans can't name a living scientist. For That's example. right. So this is really important, and it's not something that we can just leave up to chance. Is this something that you do as part of APS, or is it something that you're doing individually, or a little bit of both? Okay. Uh, the American Physical Society is tremendously helpful, and so whenever I go to Capitol Hill, I contact the APS, I contact the American Institute of Physics, an umbrella consortium that includes APS, American Association of Physics Teachers, and some others. And I tell them I'm going to be there. And sometimes they ask me to make the appointments with the staff aides. Sometimes, you know, at this point now I've been enough. They know me. They will make the appointments. And then they accompany me from one office to the next. Okay. So initially they were extremely helpful in providing fact sheets, in framing a message and saying, Mm -hmm. this is what Congress is dealing with right now. So for example, this this spring, Congress is dealing with the Competes Act, which is the, the... 
congressional act that will fund NSF. Right. And so one of the things we want to talk about is if they're going to pass this, you know, what are the restrictions that are put on NSF? One issue that's been very contentious over the last two or three years is the peer review process. And so Congress is starting to look very closely at how NSF makes funding decisions. And and a great deal of that is, in some sense, ignorant of what actually happens. So a year or two ago, I made a visit where I think I met with 10 offices. It was a ridiculous day. (laughs) And each office was, I'm here to tell you a little bit about how the peer review process at NSF works. I've been on these panels. I can tell you how many proposals I get. I can tell you the discussions we have. I can tell you about a recusal conflict of interest policy that they had no idea I don't know if it solved anything. There are still these debates. Congress would like to be able to review every single review. And I had to argue forcefully that anonymity was very important in allowing a junior scientist to criticize the Nobel Prize winner and say, this isn't a good proposal. You shouldn't fund this. Right. Those are issues that we'll go and we'll talk about that we'll do this spring. And that was framed by the American Physical Society and AIP uh, as being the issue of the day. It sounds like you're dealing with policy issues. You're also dealing with funding issues. Do you ever put in terms of priority? I mean, because obviously there's a limited amount of money. No, you, and, and that's one of the... that, that, that <laughs> Don't fund them. Fund us. No, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, the APS has gotten in trouble. Uh, certain people have gone that far to say things. Mm-hmm. And that's very dangerous, right? You know, when someone says, and it's not uncommon... Well, if I give you money, where am I supposed to take that from? There's a standard response, right? And that is, I'm not qualified to make that suggestion. This right. is why we have congressmen and senators and aides. And it is a very, very difficult job. Right. I, I have a tremendous amount of sympathy and no desire to tackle the decision of trying to figure out who you take money from and balancing the concerns of What's the population now? 350 million? Something on that. Right? So you have many people who have very legitimate concerns. And it's not my place to say their their concern doesn't matter. You shouldn't give them money. You should give it to me. Right. Uh, Because I'm not qualified to make that judgment and weigh those very grand strategic issues. Right. Um, And And in some ways, you have a a horse in the game. Well, everybody has a horse in the game. And they realize that. I mean, one of the things I actually enjoy about the Capitol of Visits is that they're very clear about that. Right? They get very impatient if you put off your ask because Mm -hmm. they know you're there to ask for something. Everyone's there to ask for something. Shut up and ask. (laughs) They don't mind it, right? If you're not asking, however, you're wasting their time. Right. And so there is this sort of matter of fact, what do you want? Which I find very refreshing. I was sitting in a a congressman's office and his aide said, I got a call last week from a constituent who was complaining that she was getting poisoned by the contrails in the airplanes. (laughs) Now... We laugh about that because as a scientist, we know that's not true, but that's a vote. Yeah. And that vote counts just as much as my vote. And (laughs) Senator Jones is weak on contrails. Right. (laughs) And so, you know, the aide was saying, how do I respond to that person? Because that person's going to vote. And that person right. actually is more likely to vote than your average scientist. And, and so if a congressman gets voted out of office, if a congresswoman gets voted out of office, they lose any influence they have over these grand decisions. So, right. so contrails or no. That's right, contrails or no. That sort of put in perspective how varied the constituency that they're responding to is. Right. So that's why it's it's I think critically important for scientists and a population that is interested and concerned with science speak up and make it clear that we do vote. We are a constituency. Uh, we're we're a, a rational, logical constituency. We're not going mm-hmm. to pick it and throw eggs and act in a way that, that sort of discredits us. But 350 million people, it's right. not unreasonable that they don't realize we're there. So do you think scientists should do this more? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think more and more scientists should be engaged in this process. And it's difficult because scientists like to do things that produce a result. We're very much right. on causality. Right. We do this, we get this out of it. And our result. And our it's, result. It's my project. Right. I don't have time for everybody else. Or or even I think I think we're beginning to broaden where we're willing to work in a volunteer if we see an impact. Right. Uh, and, and with congressional advocacy, that impact is drawn out. Nebulous at best. Well, it eventually may lead to something, but it may not. You're listening to One Universe at a Time. I'm your host, Brian Coberline. We've been talking with Dr. Scott Franklin, professor of physics at RIT, about the public advocacy of science. In our second half, Dr. Franklin asks questions, and I answer. Today, he's curious about the burgeoning discoveries of planets orbiting other stars. So we're hearing a lot about the discovery of planets that lie outside of our solar system and our galaxy, these exoplanets. Right. 
how do we find them and how do we know about them? Well, there's a few ways that we can find them. One of the biggest ways is something called a transit method. If you have a star and if you have a planet that passes in front of it, one of the big ones several years ago was the transit of Venus. Venus passes in front of the sun from our point of view. You can have that if there's a solar system that's oriented in such a way that from our line of sight, the planets pass in front of the star. And we can't see the planets individually, but what we can do is we can measure the brightness of the star. And when a planet passes in front of it, the brightness will dim a little bit by one or two percent or something. And then when the planet passes away from it, then it brightens up again. So we can see what are called these transit periods where a planet will block off some of the starlight and cause the star to appear dimmer. And that's one of the main ways that we've discovered most of the planets because the Kepler satellite has been looking at a specific patch of sky at a whole bunch of different stars and has found a whole bunch of (coughs) transiting planets. That's the biggest way. Another way you can look at it is because of the gravitational influence of a planet, because the planet pulls on a star the way the star pulls on a planet, that causes the star to wobble a little bit. And we can measure that by using what's called the Doppler effect. So we can see the red shift or blue shift of light as a star oscillates. <clears throat> and from that, we can calculate the influence of the planet. Now, you said the brightness is 1% or 2%, which seems really high, the, the decrease in brightness. Because right. I'm thinking about you know, the size of a planet compared to the size of a star, and it's right. usually one, not that one big. 1% or 2% would be really big. Okay. So, <laughs> so you, can get, you can get much smaller than that. But you're talking about a small fraction. It's not like the star is there, and then it dims significantly, mm-hmm. and then it brightens up again. I was so imagining we can't see the star as an object and see that part of it's getting dim and part of it's staying bright. No, you can see some effects of inclination, for example. The shape of the what's called the light curve, the mm-hmm. way in which it dims and the way in which it brightens, you can get some ideas of how the orbit has shifted, uh, whether it went right across the center of the star or whether it went you know, a little bit above or below. But yeah, we can't resolve for these stars anything other than this is how much light is coming from them. And transits take hours, days? They can take days, they can take hours. Uh Uh, It really depends upon the orbit of the planet. Have we been doing this long enough that we can see a planet do multiple transits so we can see that it really is going around? Yes, I think we've we've got, I think, about 18,000 confirmed exoplanets and I think about 400 and change we've had multiple passes. Mm -hmm. You really need to have multiple passes in order to really get an idea of what the orbit actual size is. You know, if you just get one dimming point, that's not really enough to confirm that it's a planet. This is part of the reason why we have candidate planets, things that look like they were a planetary transit, but we don't have enough data yet to confirm that that's what they were. The ones that are confirmed, we have multiple points to them. Do we have an idea of how large these planets are? They come in a range. So we kind of classify exoplanets in terms of Terran, which would be Earth-sized, Earth-massed, and then sub-Terran, sometimes they're called Venusian or, or Mercurian. There's super Earths, super Terran. Then there's Uranus size and Jupiter size. And and those are broad classes. So, you know, a Jupiter massed planet might be three times the mass of, of Jupiter or one and a half times the mass of Jupiter. And how do we know that about the size? How do we figure that out? We can tell that by knowing the brightness of the star, we have an idea of how big the star is. The more it dims, the more light is being blocked by the planet. And so for therefore, the bigger the planet. What When we do transit methods, for example, we can tell how big the planet is relative to the size of the star Mm -hmm. that we can estimate by its brightness and temperature. And so we don't know what its mass is, but if you know its size, you can get an idea of what its mass is. And can we tell from the gravitational wobble anything about the mass? Yeah, the same thing with the gravitational wobble. If you have an idea of the mass of the star, then the amount of wobble is proportional to how much mass the planet has. So in that case, we would be able to find the mass of the planet, but not its size. And then do these two separate measurements agree? Usually when we have a transit method, we won't necessarily have a Doppler method. When we have a Doppler method, we won't have a transit method. Sometimes we have both. There are ways that you can kind of pull information out of the data. So like I said, the way that it dims and the way that it brightens tells us something about not only its orbit, but its density and things like that. 
And so we can get a better idea of what its actual size is as opposed to just its mass is, and we can combine the two. They're still fairly rough. There are some planets in which we know pretty well in detail what its size and mass are. There are a lot of planets, you know, 1,800 planets that we have where we know its size and we can guess what its mass is, but we know its size reasonably. I mean, we know that something that's Jupiter-sized is not Earth-massed and vice versa. Do we have an idea of how likely a star is to have a planet? If you do the statistics, most stars have planets. Really? Most stars will actually have planetary systems. Mm -hmm. Many stars, the majority of stars, will have an Earth-massed planet. Planets are actually very common, and one of the things that we found with studying exoplanets is how surprisingly common they are. We can do the statistics. Part of it is you have to base upon what you can see and right. then from there determine, given the limits of your observational bias and things like that. Right. Just because you have a star is. that you're not seeing a transit doesn't mean that there is one. That right. You're just right. Not seeing and it. if you do the statistics of how likely they would be yeah. aligned with us, then you find out that, yeah, most stars will have planets. And we've observed multiple transits across the same star. Yes. So we can identify solar systems yeah there are there are a handful of solar systems i think the largest one now other than our own solar system is seven oh. planets we do know that there are planetary systems there and we can see that that influence and then how do we learn about more about those planets if we can't even see the planets uh, when we say that this is a planet that might be habitable or conducive to the possibility of life how do we figure right. that out if we can't even see the planet from the temperature of a star you can calculate what would be the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone. In in our solar system, it's roughly from Venus to Mars. So any planets between Venus to Mars could have, in a reasonable way, temperatures that have liquid water. They would get the right kind of, of heat in order to have the possibility of life in a way that we would know it. Right now, temperature is the big one that we're finding. We can't confirm whether something actually is habitable. I mean, if you take, for example, Mars and Venus, both of them are technically in a habitable zone. And if they were a different planet, they very well could be habitable. If you had, you know, something slightly larger than Earth in the orbit of Mars, it would have a thicker atmosphere, could have a stronger magnetic field. You could easily have liquid water on a planet such as that. And Mars in its early history did have liquid water. So you could have a habitable zone, but Mars is a dry rock. And Venus is the same way. You could easily have the right conditions to have liquid water in a reasonable environment, but what you have is runaway greenhouse effect and a completely inhabitable planet. So you're really looking at how many planets have the potential to have liquid water. Yeah, usually when we talk about a potentially habitable planet, the the holy grail is to find an Earth-massed or Earth-sized planet within the habitable zone that could have liquid water. And how many of those planets exist? We have a handful of them. It's one of the things that we found is that our solar system is somewhat unusual. In our solar system, we have small rocky planets close to the sun and then large gas planets farther out. And a lot of the solar systems that we're seeing have large gas planets really close to the star. So what we call hot Jupiters. And that's actually more common. It's more common to find large planets close to the star. And we know part of that is because of the way they form that in the accretion disk of an early star, when large masses start to form, there's a drag effect that tends to pull them closer to the star. And so you tend to have closer large planets than you have farther away. So it's very possible that the most habitable types of planets would actually be moons around Jupiter-sized planets. So if they're in the habitable zone, you could have a Jupiter-mass planet in Earth's orbit, for example, Mm -hmm. and Europa would be liquid water. It would be warm enough for liquid water. It would have a thick atmosphere. So so we're starting to look farther afield in terms of what habitable means. Mm -hmm. We're still looking at liquid water because everything that we know about life, you need the right molecular ingredients and you need liquid water. Uh, mm-hmm. That may not be the case, but we have a sample size of one, right. so, so that's what we deal with. <laughs> so what's next in this? I mean, you can imagine continuing to look for exoplanets and looking at different parts of the sky and doing more of the same. Right. What do you think is sort of the next direction to take this to learn something new or in a different direction? One of the big things in the next direction is to try and get spectroscopic information from transits. So if you have a planet that passes in front of a star, if it has an atmosphere, the sunlight will pass through that atmosphere, some of the light will be absorbed, and you can determine what type of molecules are in that air. If we could say, for example, this is 
a mass planet that has water vapor in its atmosphere. It has oxygen in its atmosphere. Um, it has carbon dioxide, things like that. Then you can start really pinning down what we really mean by habitable, not just in terms of temperature, but in terms of having the right atmospheric conditions for living organisms in the way that we would know. That really is involving different models of what's blocking this light. Right. Because you're not just looking at a solid that blocks all of the light. Um, you're looking at, at both the atmospheric part. We've done a little bit of this with Jupiter-sized planets. So, mm-hmm. so with that, since they're gas planets and they have a very thick atmosphere, as they come in front of the star, you can start to see what spectrum is absorbed first. And as they leave the star, you can see what spectrum is absorbed last. Okay, so when it blocks the whole thing, that's that's the light. But these colors go off first, so this is the type of atmosphere. So okay. we've detected, for example, water in gas planets. Really? Yes. So we know some of the compounds that are there. What we haven't done is with Earth-massed planets, Earth-sized planets. Mm-hmm. That's much more difficult. We don't have a thick atmosphere compared to Jupiter. Jupiter has a massively thick atmosphere, mm-hmm. and large gas planets would have very thick atmospheres. So you have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles of air from a side view and that you could actually see this Moving come in. Too. And to really get the absorption levels, you're, you're talking about much less than 100 miles for Earth. Right. So it's a matter of sensitivity. So we know in principle we can do this, but we haven't been able to do it with Earth-massed planets. Is it the type of thing where there's a limit on our sensitivity, where ultimately we may never be able to do this for Earth-sized planets? Or do we think that as we get telescopes that are further out or of a different geometry, we'll be able to? Yeah, it doesn't have to be further out, but a different geometry. The big thing is doing the sensitivity. You have to have typically a space-based telescope that would be large enough or connected enough in order to actually observe this. I mean, there are proposals out there. One of them is to have something called a sunshade. So if you could, for example, have something like the Hubble telescope, but in front of it would be this foil panel that would block out a particular star. Mm -hmm. And so you could block out the starlight, but you could still see the light from the planets. And so if you have that on a large enough scale, you could actually start resolving individual planets. You could see the reflected light Mm -hmm. off Mm -hmm. of their surface. And when you get that, then you can get not only what the surface conditions are, but what the atmospheric conditions are. You know, that's a large project and and go ahead and lobby for that. (laughs) But (laughs) advocate, advocate. Advocate for that. (laughs) Very important (laughs) distinction. That's right. That's right. But we're actually at the point where we can make credible proposals to see the reflected light off of a planet. This really is a matter of engineering and money. In the same way that if you said in 1960, could we put a man on the moon? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do that. We have that engineering ability. It's a matter of financial commitment. The same thing would be true. Could we find habitable planets around other stars? Yes. It's a matter of having the right telescope and the right effort. And how far away are these exoplanets? Within several hundred light years. Uh We actually have only looked at a very small patch of sky Mm -hmm. because the the Kepler telescope only looked at a specific patch of sky and a very small specific patch of sky and what we haven't done is had the kind of global surveys one of the interesting things that's coming out is there's a gaia telescope what's called called the gaia spacecraft its primary role is to measure the positions and velocities of a billion stars in our local region of the milky way one percent of the milky way but it's a billion stars because of the data because we're getting the position data and the doppler data all of that data can be gleaned for exoplanets as well. So the Doppler effect of using planets, and because it's looking at spectra, we may also get Uh atmospheric Uh spectra data. So some of these experiments that aren't targeted at exoplanets can be used for exoplanets. We've been talking with Dr. Scott Franklin, a professor of physics at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Our program is produced at RIT by Mark Gillespie with support from the RIT College of Science. I'm your host, Brian Korberlein. Thanks for listening to One Universe at a Time.